Welcome to The New Paradigm for Mankind, a weekly discussion between Lyndon LaRouche and his scientific associates in which we investigate the true nature of the creative human mind and the ideas necessary for the progress of mankind. Good afternoon and welcome to the July 16, 2014 edition of The New Paradigm for Mankind. My name is Creighton Jones and joining me in the studio today are Benjamin Denniston and Jason Ross of the LaRouche Pack Scientific Research Team. Now as the title suggests, we will be discussing a new paradigm for mankind. And we've seen some indications of momentum towards exactly that in what is now taking place in Brazil. And we're not talking about the after party of the World Cup. We're talking about the BRICS summit. And this is a summit which the BRICS nations, this is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, who have come together in Brazil with other nations also participating on the sidelines, such as Argentina, where probably the most important thing which has come out of this discussion is the announcement of the formation of a national development bank which is being proposed as a counterweight to the defunct and failed IMF and World Bank system. A system which, as they have indicated, has really been used to enslave nations rather than develop them as they were originally intended to do. Now, in addition to the formation of this new bank, which, as they said, explicitly is developed for the intention of developing infrastructure for pulling together funds among these nations to finance growth initiatives throughout the world. Now along with that you've had also on the sideline of this summit a number of bilateral talks and agreements among for example Russia and Brazil, Russia and Argentina. In both cases the principal point of discussion was on nuclear power development which obviously will have the Queen's panties in a bunch but that's, that's okay. Um, in addition to that, on the issue of nuclear power, you've had South Africa has recently announced the intention to build six new nuclear power plants there in South Africa, for where South Africa could be a driver for bringing power, for bringing light to an otherwise dark continent. Now you've also had, in addition, discussions going on between China and India around not only border cooperation, but also China inviting India to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which again would be similar to this, this National Development Bank, which would be an infrastructure bank in Asia intended for exactly that, generating funds, generating credit for investment into new infrastructure projects, which as we've seen, China is really taking a lead on with the new Silk Road project which uh, Helga Zepp LaRouche and our movement as a whole has been very instrumental in promoting the idea of high-speed rail, development corridors, nuclear power, and the like. So you see a real potential building coming out of this summit and coming out of other similar type discussions where the world is now openly discussing and coming to full realization of the fact that the, the Western system, the transatlantic system, is dead and is collapsing and is threatening to bring the entire world down with it into a new dark age if some alternative is not proposed. Now you see the insanity of what the transatlantic system, the London Wall Street financier system is doing to try to hold on to their power. You know, we've got new initiatives being put forward by the just mentioned IMF, by the European Central Bank with Draghi saying no, what we need to do is just have more monetary pumping, a new round of qualitative easing to try to bail out these banks, but which would do nothing more than further increase this ongoing process of hyperinflationary blowout. So, and then you look to the United States and you see what's happening here in physical terms. I mean, we've got, as is all over the press, this border crisis. We've got thousands, tens of thousands of refugees trying to flee into the United States, many of them children, who, what are they fleeing? They're fleeing situations, largely in South Africa, of severe violence, severe poverty, 
you know, lack of development, lack of clean water, food. I mean, they're leaving in desperation to try to come and find a better life. But they're fleeing a situation which was largely created by the kinds of conditions which the transatlantic system has imposed on Central America. You know, for example, much of this violence is being carried out at the hands of these drug gangs. Mm -hmm. Drug gangs, which are the backbone, really, of the $100 billion drug industry, which is used to finance and fuel the continuing bubble of the transatlantic system. But now they're coming into a United States, largely borders along places like Texas and California, which, despite what they may think they're coming into, is actually itself in a crisis situation. And I'm referring to, among other things, the drought crisis, which we've addressed. You know, where it was just, I just saw an article yesterday, um, Los Angeles City has said that they are now facing the worst drought in recorded history. Since they've kept records in Los Angeles going back to, I think, 1887, they're currently in the worst drought they've ever experienced on record. And as you've indicated before, Ben, there have been a number of studies, new studies, which indicate that even this past century has actually been one of the wettest for the West Coast in 7,000 year history. So the idea that this may be just a temporary thing, that it's, the water cycle is gonna come back, is a myth. You know, in the so-called savior for this year, El Nino, it's now being discussed or it's now being realized is gonna be much, much weaker than they originally thought. So there is no natural solution which is going to bring about a resolution to this drought crisis. Mm -hmm. But that's what we face here in the so-called West, is an ongoing collapse of the financial system, a physical collapse, a drought, and really the prospect of a real physical dark age. So against this, we've got what Mr. LaRouche has been proposing, which are his four laws. The immediate enactment of Glass-Steagall to create the, bank, the necessary banking separation and necessary bankruptcy of the defunct transatlantic system. The creation of a national bank along the Hamiltonian lines. The generation of new long-term credit to finance infrastructure projects. And the fourth point, the commitment to the development of thermonuclear fusion as the driver, the science driver for this new paradigm to bring mankind into this new age of development and cooperation. But of course, that's not something that's, you can put that on paper, but to realize that is in fact gonna require something more than just a, a mandate or just a law, it's gonna require an actual shift in thinking to make the necessary breakthroughs in fusion and in space science and what have you, is gonna require a shift towards the kind of epistemological outlook typified by what Mr. LaRouche has identified as these two triads. Mm -hmm. The first triad of Brunelleschi, Cusa, and Kepler, and the more recent triad of Einstein, Planck, and Vernadsky, which is an epistemology, which is an, a, a scientific approach, which has largely been ignored and lost among contemporary scientists. So today, we hope to give people a better sense of exactly what that change has to be, what this higher order of epistemological and scientific outlook is. And for that, We'll start with Mr. Jason Ross. <laughs> All right, well, uh, to get into these triads, we're going to look at today the comparison between Vernadsky laying the foundation for resolving the paradoxes of the small and large raised by Planck and Einstein by looking back at how Kepler resolved the paradoxes left by Brunelleschi and Cusa in the small and the large. So Brunelleschi, um, as we've covered in some various ways, Brunelleschi applied a new approach to the very small to successfully build the dome of the cathedral at Florence. And Cusa laid out the essential framework for the discovery of universal principles in his coincidence of opposites. So I want to read a couple of quotes from Cusa um, that then lead into Kepler. This is from Cusa's work on learned ignorance, book two of On Learned Ignorance, a work which created the foundation for modern science. So Cusa says that, however, it is not the case that in any genus, even the genus of motion, 
we come to an unqualifiedly maximum and minimum. Hence, if we consider the various movements of the spheres, we will see that it is not possible for the world machine to have, as a fixed and immovable center, either our perceptible earth, or air, or fire, or anything. For with regard to motion, we do not come to an unqualifiedly minimum, that is, to a fixed center. Read that sentence again. With regard to motion, we do not come to an unqualifiedly minimum, to a fixed center. For the unqualifiedly minimum must coincide with the unqualifiedly maximum. And therefore, the center of the world coincides with the circumference. Kuza here is referring back to something he developed in the first book of Unlearned Ignorance about how in the truly infinite, maximal and minimal no longer oppose each other, and that abstracting them from quantity and size, it, is, it becomes the same concept. The two things which seem certainly opposite each other really aren't when you get to the higher level from which, in which they actually exist. Guza says that in the created world, nothing will ever be, you know, there aren't any absolutes uh, in the created world. You're not going to find absolute equality. You'll never find two things that are completely equal. So, let me keep going. He says, um, uh, let's see here. Therefore, the earth, which cannot be the center, cannot be devoid of all motion. Indeed, it is even necessary that the earth be moved in such a way that it could be moved infinitely less. Therefore, just as the earth is not the center of the world, so the sphere of fixed stars is not its circumference. Although, when we compare the earth with the sky, the former seems nearer the center and the latter to the circumference. And therefore, the earth is not the center of the eighth sphere, the supposed sphere of fixed stars, or of any other sphere. So, in laying out the distinction between things that appear contradictory to the senses or to the, the this lower level of thinking, which Kuza calls rationality, where paradoxes can arise that are no longer paradoxical on an intellectual level, considered in the domain of the principles that give rise to them, you know, this whole approach totally goes against Aristotle or you know, Ayn Rand or you know, people who say you know, that you can't have A and not A. And this is like you know, the basis of wisdom. A and not A, you can't have them both at the same time. Mm. He says, sure you can. You know, think about, you know, <laughs> here's, the, here's the trouble with, you know, with, with that kind of thinking, is that you start, it starts becoming based on words. And words have a certain meaning, and people try to, to define these words very precisely. You can't. I mean, it, you know, they have a context to them. So the idea that something couldn't be one way and its opposite at the same time, if you're thinking about something the wrong way, of course you'll, you, that could happen to you. If you're thinking about anything incorrectly, you're going to arrive at conclusions about it that contradict each other because your approach is wrong. You know, take for example, let me read one more quote from Unlearned Ignorance Book 2. Kuza says that whatever is not truth cannot measure truth precisely. For comparison, he says, a, a non-circle cannot measure a circle whose being is something indivisible. Hence, the intellect, which is not truth, never comprehends truth so precisely that truth cannot be comprehended infinitely more precisely. We're always going to have more learning to do. For the intellect is to the truth as the inscribed polygon is to the inscribing circle. The more angles the inscribed polygon has, so imagine a square, an octagon, a sixteenagon, you increase the number of sides, it looks more like a circle. Uh, the more angles the inscribed polygon has, the more similar it is to a circle. However, even if the number of its angles is increased ad infinitum, the polygon never becomes equal to the circle unless it is resolved into an identity with the circle. So, you know, you might say, well, how many angles are in, here's a perfect example of A and not A at the same time. How many angles are in a circle? Zero, because there's no angles in a circle. And at the same time, it also seems like an infinite number. Zero and infinite are very different. You might even say A and not A. So, when you're under, trying to understand something from the wrong standpoint, you get contradictions. And thank God, because if we didn't, we would never know we were wrong and learn something. So that's the whole basis of knowledge, is when contradictions arise. That's how you get to know new things and find out when you're wrong, by contradictions. So, uh, so Kuz had laid this out in describing how you can't have a, a circle. You know, how could you, how could you have a circle that couldn't be more circular? No planet moves in a circle. The Earth is not the middle of everything because nothing can be stationary. How could it be so still? It couldn't be more still. It just doesn't make any sense. 
and that no motion can be so equal to itself over time that every moment of the motion is so equal to, the, to its previous or succeeding moment that it couldn't have been more equal? You don't get that kind of absolute equality. So we don't have circles, and we don't have equal motion. Kuz has laid that out already, way before uh, Kepler. And I don't, this was advice Copernicus didn't take uh, at all, <laughs> the advice that Copernicus rejected. So what I want to talk about is, you know, so Kuza is leaving behind a paradox. He doesn't have an answer. He's got an approach. He's got an idea about how to approach an all, but he doesn't, kept, you know, Kuza did not figure out how the planets moved. He knew that they didn't move based on circles and geometry and equal motions. But what does that mean could be making them move now? What else do you have? What is there? Nothing. <laughs> nothing, that, nothing that anyone had put forward before. So Kepler, Kepler steps into this void uh, in to, to resolve the, the problem that Lacusa had, had developed. So just to go through a, a few things about Kepler and also um, make fun of a scandalous plagiarism, an incompetent plagiarism of the basement's work on this. Um, okay, so here, here's a couple wrong things about Kepler. This is from a silly website called keplersdiscovery.com, which uh, is misnamed. Now, this website, I'm just going to show one example of this. If you go through it, you can find about a million examples. Uh, copied the work that was done by the basement at science.larouchepack.com. Here's one example. This is one of the, uh, I'd say, graph more graphically challenged animations <laughs> on the, uh, the basement website. This is kind of an ugly animation, I think. It's, it's, it's showing area time as applied to the planets. Despite its, uh, you know, infelicitous appearance, <laughs> this is one example of how the, you know, this, this, this plagiaristic website copied all the animations directly. The other thing is that because the, um, the scoundrels who put this together didn't understand how anything worked, all of the animations on this site are like a cartoon. That is, they're drawn frame by frame on, you know, on transparent paper, so to speak, and then put together. There's no understanding of what's the, behind the motions. I mean, let me read one thing about this. So this silly website uh, is talking about how did Kepler discover that the planets move in ellipses. Mm -hmm. We've heard, or maybe we've heard, or you could hear if you just look in a book or ask Wikipedia or something, that Kepler had discovered three laws. That planets move in ellipses, that they sweep out equal areas in equal time, and then the third law provides a correspondence between a planet's overall distance from the sun and the length of its yearly revolution around it. Okay, so first off, those laws are in the wrong order. Okay, but here, here, how did Kepler discover the ellipse? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit of this and then contrast it with the truth. Um, if the usual popular accounts of Kepler's Mars work are anything to go by, William Donahue noted in a 1988 article in the Journal of the History of Astronomy, all he had to do was plot points on the orbit by triangulation and note that they all fall on an ellipse with one focus at the sun. Donahue continues, to the few scholars who have actually studied Kepler's new astronomy, however, it is clear that the points plotted do not fall so neatly. Uh, Donahue is correct. The idea that Kepler just sort of looked at where the planet was and saw that it sat on an ellipse, not true. And you know, then this site, the silly site, quotes somebody else. Then it says, here we go, keep reading here. Kepler had discovered, this is in the words of the scoundrel, Kepler had discovered that the orbit of Mars could not be a circle, but rather some kind of oval shape. We discuss his geometrical demonstration here, where we copy an, another animation from the basement website. After ruling out various possibilities using a triangulation procedure that employed the physically false but accurately predictive vicarious hypothesis to generate orbital elements, Kepler postulated the idea of an ellipse as the shape of the orbit. He then used the elliptical model to generate a table of planetary positions and tried to make it look as if he had arrived at these results by triangulation. We might criticize him for this method, but why did Kepler get it right? I'm sort of realizing that to our most people in the audience, the fact that that's completely wrong would not be immediately apparent. It is completely wrong. This does not describe what Kepler did. He says Kepler, Kepler looked at the uh, conic sections, looked at ellipses, blah, blah, blah. Totally untrue. So let's, uh, let, me, let me 
let me go back to what Kepler actually did. He, and this is, you know, this is important for then looking at how, um, we'll, we'll see the importance of it. So, Kepler, after proving that, basically doing exactly what Kuza said, and proving that circles don't exist, and that nothing equal, there's not an equal motion that makes the planets move, is then left with the question that he forces his audience to consider. What is making them move? He's implicitly outlawed all of geometry, because any kind of geometric regularity is going to be forbidden by this concept that what could be so equal that it couldn't be yet more equal? We don't find those things in, in nature. So we have a general sense of physics, of a physical cause. Kepler's first approach to that is to review something that he had thought as a young man, that the sun makes the planets move, and that's why they move close when they're near the sun and slow when they're far from it. That had been explained using an imaginary point in space around which the planets moved in equal angles in equal times. But Kepler said, forget it. The sun's the, sun's the reason that they move. It's the physical cause of motion, not just at the middle of circles that are drawn by the planets, as Copernicus had it. Hmm. When he starts trying to implement this physical hypothesis, everything that used to be depended on in astronomy disappears. What does the center of the orbit mean? If part of the orbit is related to the sun, Copernicus didn't think any of the planets went around the sun. He involved sort of a, an approximation to the sun in determining their, their, their orbits. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the actual centers, where they were off center. So the center doesn't actually exist. There's no point there. Kepler's not going to use any imaginary points. All he really has is the power of the sun to make the planets move, and that's it. So it's like he just stepped out into this huge cavernous, he's in this cave. It's totally dark. He has no idea what's in there, how big it is, how to find his way around. He has to produce all of the tools himself to navigate this completely foreign space. So he uses the analogy of, of magnetism, which had been discovered to exist in the Earth, that uh, Gilbert had shown more about how magnetism worked and that the Earth was a magnet. Before that, many people thought the North Star was magnetic. That that's why compasses worked, because they're pointing at a star. Why assume it's the Earth itself? The, you know, metal doesn't stick to the Earth. You can, you know, no more than anything else likes to fall down. So Kepler uses this as an analogy to try to understand things. But he is really stumped at trying to figure out what shape the orbit would have. And the first thing he does is like what that silly website described. He postulated some shapes. He tried an ellipse in chapter 48 of his book. It didn't work. He tried a geometrical way of making the planet come closer and farther from the sun based on an epicycle, something he didn't think actually existed. But just to try something, try to find out more about this by interacting with it and, and testing it. What he finally arrives at, I'm going to read a few quotes from him. Get rid of that silly website. OK. So here's a quote of his discovery. This is from chapter 56 of Kepler's New Astronomy. He says, well, I was anxiously, I, uh, well, it's not necessary to add, that, well, never mind. The, uh, while I was anxiously turning this thought over in my mind, reflecting that nothing was accomplished by chapter 45. Where, chapter 45 is where he tries this somewhat hokey geometric way of making the planet come closer and farther from the sun that he never really thought was going to work. He says, reflecting that nothing was accomplished by chapter 45, and consequently my triumph over Mars was futile, quite by chance, I hit upon the secant of the angle 5 degrees and 18 minutes, hmm. which is the measure of the greatest optical equation. And when I saw that this was 100,429, it was as if I was awakened from sleep to see a new light. That's an opaque quote. That's, that, 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 well, I don't think that just reading that quote is going to help us all relive, of course, 100,429, naturally, Kepler. How, how couldn't you have seen that before? Well, what he does is he, um, he realizes a somewhat complicated construction, some way of that he can do geometrically that would give distances from the sun that he thinks would probably make sense. But there's no physical basis for them. And Kepler is not going to cheat. He's not going to say, well, this works, so it's good enough. I triangulated. This construction seems to function. He won't do that. He's not a liar. He's not dishonest. What he does is in a very, very, very thorough, and certainly I can go through any of this here, a very thorough um, 
treatment of, he looks at the physics of magnets, the physics of, of, of balancing, um, you know, of levers, and basically, you know, the distance you are from the fulcrum and how strong a force that would be. So he puts everything together, and um, here's just a couple of pictures of it. He actually, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's impossible to summarize briefly. But he starts looking at how it is that the, um, that based on the orientation of a magnetic potential in each planet compared to the sun, he, he's able to determine, based on the physics of things, how strongly the magnet would pull the planet towards the sun or, or push it away. And then he does, he sort of starts doing calculus. He, he figures out how if you add up all of these small pushes, what the resulting shape would be. And he, you know, and he, and he arrives at the, um, the distance he was thinking of. He then makes a very small correction, just to, so I'm going to describe how Kepler places the planet. And you'll notice that I'm not going to use the word ellipse. See if I do. Okay? Keep an eye on me. So here's the planet. Uh, here, here's what its orbit would be. Hopefully, maybe you can see that tiny mouse pointer. It passes through point D. So this is a circle, but Kepler's saying the planet doesn't move on a circle. If the planet would have been at D, what he does is he draws a line through the center at B. You know what? I'm not including the picture. Um, here it is. Use this one again. If the planet would have been at V, he draws a line to the center, B. He drops a perpendicular to that line from the sun at A, creating point R, which you see here. He then takes that length, RV, and he says RV is the correct distance of the planet from the sun. Um, based on it, this secant thing he had mentioned earlier, it does correspond to adding up the, the impulsions that the magnet would have been giving it based on his physical hypothesis. He then says, take that distance RV, set your compass to it, put the metal part at A, and spin the pencil up here, and then you'll hit the spot where the planet should be. Pretty complex. He makes a slight correction and says that you should actually swing your compass from point E up to point F, which is on the perpendicular drop from the point on the circle the planet would have been to its diameter. He says the planet will be at F based on the physical, um, the physical power of magnetism pulling the planet in and out. Okay, now you notice that word I didn't use, right? After he does this, Kepler notices Oh, that makes an ellipse. Right? So Kepler did not, after, you know, heeding what Cusa had said about geometry not being the basis for anything, he didn't, like, you know, you know those, those children's toys where you get the triangle block and you put it through the triangle mm -hmm. hole and the square block. And Kepler didn't pull out his blocks and see, you know, which, which shape fit the orbit. He had a physical principle that caused the planet's speed to change at every moment. Mm -hmm. Think about this. Instead of a constant motion in that, the motion is the same at every moment. We have a constant relationship. The speed is based on how far you are from the sun. That is the that principle is always the same. The motions are different at every moment. Mm -hmm. You don't have this equality on the level of the physical. You have it on the level of the intellectual, on the level of cause. And that's not a contradiction. Then he's got this magnetic power that causes a planet to move in and out in a you know as a I don't know if you followed every spot of that, but, you know, it's not exactly the easiest construction. That does make an ellipse. So Kepler concludes, oh, the planet moves in an ellipse. But it was as physically constructed a curve as, and if you don't get this reference, I'm sorry, but the, the cycloid is a geometric curve, mm -hmm. a mechanical geometric curve. It just so happens that if you ask the question of what is the shape of a roller coaster path, that would get you from one spot to another the fastest, it is a cycloid. That wasn't discovered by testing out which shape was the best. It was just by discovering what, how the curve would have to be curved at every moment and finding, oh, it's a cycloid. Simpl similar here. So Kepler, Kepler arrives at an ellipse, um, and he does so based on these physical considerations. So he has filled out and done what Kepler posed to future thinkers to do. Mm -hmm. It's not an equal circle. There is no equal motion. Geometry overall can't provide the basis for, any, for understanding any of these emotions that we perceive or pull together. What is? Who knows? Kepler, using physical analogies, is able to put forward a 
comprehensive physical hypothesis for the cause of the planet's motions, which in the end results in them moving in an ellipse and where they sweep out equal areas in equal time. And here's the thing about that. When Kepler finished this book, he didn't think that area measured the time. He, he noticed that it worked, but he didn't believe it because he didn't have a physical reason for it. So although he concludes the book using it, mm -hmm. he says, you know, whoever can figure out the, you know, the problem here you know, is, will, will really be saving the day because he thought the real power was based on the distance from the sun. Area was a way of adding up the distances, but to him it was sort of a mathematical trick. It wasn't real. The distance was real. So Kepler ends up solving the problem himself later in the epitome of Copernican astronomy, you know, uh, 10 years later. Um, so, so I just wanted to lay that out. That, that, uh, so Ke Kepler, you know, you've got this, this principle in the small, the, the way that the, the sun's activity acts on the planet is changing at every moment. It is a universal principle. It's a whole concept. The full concept of gravitation by Kepler is in the harmonies of the world. Um, and he's performed this resolution by developing a new framework from which to approach the problems that existed only as paradoxes or, as quest or largely as paradoxes and questions before him. And I think that if we, I uh, won't well, overly preempt here, but if we look at Vernadsky uh, and the second triad of Planck and Einstein, Planck and Einstein left a lot of, they, they, they certainly discovered things mm -hmm. and they gave us some answers. You know, black body radiation, we understand it now thanks mm -hmm. to Planck. Einstein, we got the photoelectric effect, we've got general relativity, you know, we, we, we've got these things. But mostly what we've got is a lot of new questions. Quantum mechanics is incredibly complicated. And you hear people tell you about, you know, if you try to study it, prepare to, you know, leave your sense of reason behind because it doesn't make any sense and you just have to get used to it. That's what they tell you. So it's a lot of problems. And the way to resolve them isn't something that Planck and Einstein, they didn't do it. They didn't resolve all of these problems. Just like Kuzi didn't figure out how the planets moved. He figured out what, the, what wasn't and what the approach should be. And then, uh, I'm not going to say Fernandesky has solved the paradoxes of quantum mechanics because he hasn't, but I think that, that the several key aspects of his approach in his work provide a basis for thinking about how to make such a resolution, specifically by, just as Kepler brought in a, a new concept of what physics could mean, mm -hmm that Vernadsky is providing us with several tools, such as different scales of time, such as the different phase spaces of the non-living, the living, and the cognitive, and I think provides a framework for realizing that our overall approach had been unnecessarily restricted, that the abiotic laboratory experimental range doesn't include larger scales, doesn't include different time frames, such as we find in life, generational time, evolutionary time, and it doesn't uh, take into account what we could discover uh, from astronomy. So let me just read one quote from LaRouche on that and then uh, hand it over to you, Ben. Uh, LaRouche, he'd said, uh, that's what the purpose of astronomy is. It's not to study where the bugs are moving around in space, but to find out what the boundary conditions are within which space is organized. This was in a part of a discussion he had about looking at the solar system in the context of the galaxy and the galaxy in the context of larger processes to understand any of them. Mm -hmm. So, hand it over here. This is, you know, overall it's um, part of the challenge that Lynn put on the table to us, the basement and our organization over the last uh, week or so. It's kind of been some of the background to the discussion of some of this. And, you know, I think what he put on the table with what he's been discussing with this defining the character of, these of the development of modern science with these two triads. And from a real organic understanding of that process, how it actually occurred, how do we extend it? How do we take it further? And Cody, as you discussed, we are on the brink of a new paradigm, a new paradigm for what mankind can be on this planet and in the solar system. And Mr. LaRouche has been putting on the table, how do we now make a new paradigm in science? And as part of that, uh, as Jason just, just indicated, we have to look to some of these new anomalous questions from this standpoint, from the standpoint of Kepler's work, from the standpoint of Vernadsky's work. And 
One aspect that I'm going to discuss a little bit is now then how this applies to the very large and to some questions of astronomy. And as you just said, not just looking at bugs floating around, but looking at how do we actually get, as I think you said very well, some idea of real physical cause. What are the new levels of physical cause that we have yet to discover that is governing and creating and defining what we live in as an anti-entropic universe? And how is that, what are the new principles to be discovered on these very large scales? And in that, Mr. LaRouche off and on has kind of defined what he calls a series of nested systems as kind of like a beginning basis to look at. And he said, you got to look at this nesting between the sol the solar system is like a self-bounded system, a self-bounded process. But it's subsumed by the galaxy, by the galactic process. And we were discussing this a bit the other day, and you know, our associate Leona, I think, made a very good point where she said it's not, it's not just subsumed in extension in space, but it's subsumed in action as a process of development. You know, get away from the idea of just thinking uh, the galaxy is just a whole bunch of particular parts self-defined and our system is just in that part, just one part of that mess of things. But instead, how do you think of the galaxy as a self-bounded process that subsumes not just spatially but physically in terms of action and development, the solar system? And if you go beyond that, Mr. LaRouche put on the table, look, look to what he was calling the supergalactic scale. How does some st structure of activity subsume galaxies, any one particular galaxy? And if you look into this, and I'm going to kind of play with a few examples here and look at it from the standpoint of a few hints I think Vernotsky gives us. Um, there's a lot of very provocative questions that are not going to be solved without this methodological standpoint that Jason just presented us with. And, Mr. LaRouche is defined as these two successive triads. So I'm going to kind of give a sketch of each of these nestings, um, solar system, galactic, supergalactic. Uh, one thing Mr. LaRouche pointed to in our discussion with him last week was something we've investigated off and on over the last few years in the basement team, which is uh, the relationship between periodicities and cycles found in various proxy records, various records of activity on the Earth system. And the best of our current understanding of the motion of the solar system through our galaxy. And this points to some very interesting questions about the nature of the relationship between our galaxy as a self-bounded developing process and activity in the solar system. And what you can see here is kind of a cartoonish illustration of a mapping of some of these different cycles. On the left, in the green, uh, the current, our best understanding of the motion of our solar system through the galaxy as of today is that we think there's a roughly 60 or 62 million year cycle of so-called bobbing up and down kind of above and below the galactic plane the disk of our galaxy. And what we find very interestingly is that corresponding with those cycles of motion of our solar system through the galaxy is a periodic fluctuation in the biodiversity in the fossil record, the amount of life, the number of different species existing at any one given time, which is a very provocative relationship. It's been studied by a number of people now, different scientists, have kind of picked up on this, reanalyzed it, and posed a lot of questions. How, why is this the case? Why is there a relationship between the evolution of life in the records we have and our understanding of the motion of the solar system through the galaxy? But then we also see that there's a couple other records measured in um, uh, the rate of sedimentation formation in certain records and the amount of... Um, kind of exposed land area on continents fluctuating, potentially, potentially relating to changing sea levels or changing levels of continents themselves. So basically two geophysical processes. 
also show similar periodicities as 60, roughly 60 million year periodicity in cycles of this activity. So that's one set of um, uh, one set of activity, as well as some indication that potentially large scale volcanism, <clears throat> large scale volcanic activity, potentially lining up with that as well. You have another cycle of act of the relationship between our solar system and our galaxy, which is the passage through the spiral arms, and that also not quite as cleanly, but in an interesting way, does seem to correlate to changes in biodiversity in the, in the evolutionary record on Earth. And it also changes, corresponds to records of cosmic radiation flux and large-scale climate change, uh, what they call ice house events. Mm. So if you think it's cold now, uh, you should take a bigger picture because there's been periods where nearly the entire Earth has been covered in ice. Imagine the ice caps just growing and expanding like all the way down, approaching the equator at certain periods. So you've had these so-called ice house events, which to our best understanding of the records here corresponds to periods of increased cosmic radiation flux, increased radiation from the galaxy coming into the solar system, and the passage of our solar system through these spiral arms. So already we're seeing a lot of kind of different lines of investigation pointing into a whole new domain of solar system galactic interaction, which defines one very provocative um, area or level of investigation. Now, I think to, to truly understand this, I would pose that we need to actually discover, uh, as Kepler discovered a principle of the solar system, we have yet to discover a principle of the galaxy. And currently what science is trying to do is basically just taking the mathematics of gravitation, the mathematical equations derived from Kepler's discovery, not even Kepler's discovery, just the equation, like Jason mentioned, you go to school, you get three laws, boom, 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 this is, this is Kepler's work, which is just a total fraud. If you're paying a couple hundred thousand dollars for that education, you should ask for a refund, because I mean that's not an education. Um, you know, they take certain equations and then try and apply them on a galactic scale. And that's a lot of anomalies immediately come up, a lot of questions. And there's, it, I think it points to the fact that we don't have yet, have yet to discover a principle of organization of the galaxy. And if we're going to understand these types of questions, we have to understand what the hell a galaxy is. What is a galaxy is a developing, changing system. What is the principle that governs that, the physical cause that governs that? And how do we then understand the relationship of our own solar, our own solar system, our own planet Earth, life on Earth, climate on Earth, from that higher standpoint? And this is some of the things that define the questions going into this new paradigm that we're fighting to create. So now to get at this question of what is a galactic system, I want to start by reading a quote from Vladimir Vernotsky from 1938 from a paper called The Problems of Biogeochemistry II. Now in this paper he largely deals with the space-time of life, of living matter as he calls it. What is the space? He posits the idea that there is a different space-time to a living organism compared with the abiotic, non-living domain of the biosphere. And he gives a very clear, rigorous, and thorough investigation of that. It's a very important, very provocative work. Towards the end of it, he kind of raises some of the general questions about space, time, in science more broadly, from the standpoint of looking at this investigation in life. And certain questions come up, certain issues come up about, well, can, can you have different spaces? Can you have different times? Who was looking at this? What ideas are out there? You know, he's really wrestling with this whole conception um, that, to put it in terms of the triads, was really launched by Riemann played a critical role in raising a lot of these more general questions. And then clearly Einstein took this up in a critical way 
with just breaking the idea of absolute space, absolute time as independent things. You know, so Vernadsky is following through in this scientific revolution started by the second set of scientific thinkers that Linz pointed to. So in addressing the kind of general question of space, time, um, Vernadsky states towards the end of this writing, he says, before going further, it is indispensable to clarify to what extent it is possible in our current scientific reality to admit simultaneous manifestations of spaces characterized by different geometries in different domains. So to admit simultaneous manifestations of different spaces characterized by different geometries. He goes on, he says, to me it seems that people today assume that such a thing is impossible without actually submitting the question to analysis. We can see this from the history of geometry. In the time of Lobachevsky, oh, in, this, in his time, Lobachevsky allowed the possibility that the structure of space of scientific reality was defined by a single new geometry, which he had discovered, rather or instead of the Euclidean geometry. He tried to arrive at an experimental test of this conclusion by taking real measurements of the largest triangles of stars he could find in the heavens. At present, at present time, Eddington is trying to detect the true four-dimensional space, one of the Ramanian spaces, corresponding to Einstein's concept, conception of the cosmos. But all of this is only the simplest and most abstract conception of the cosmos, which might satisfy the geometry, ge the geometer, or the theoretical physicist, but which contradicts the entire empirical knowledge of the naturalist. Another conclusion is a logical possibility. The conception of the geometrical inhomogeneity of reality. The, you don't, the reality is not characterized by a single homogeneous geometry everywhere. This is closer to precise empirical knowledge without con contradicting what we know scientifically. It is a supposition that in different cases and different manifestations of the cosmos, different geometries may be manifested in phenomena under scientific study. The hypothesis of a single unified geometry for the cosmos as a whole for the entirety of reality is inseparably connected with the hypothesis that the propositions of geometry originate as special properties of our reason. The history of geometry refutes this. And then just uh, two sections later, he says, to pull out another brief fragment, he says, speaking about space-time, we merely indicate the inseparability of one from the other inseparability from, of space from time. For science, there is no space without energy and matter, nor in the same sense without time. So he's kind of positing the idea that we need to go beyond just a space-time, but more of a space, time, energy, matter is not separated phenomena. You can just in, 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 uh, investigate independently. And he poses very clearly that He's dealing with this in living organisms, the idea that there's a unique space-time to a living organism, which is different than the immediately surrounding space-time of the abiotic domain, or the non-living domain of the biosphere. And he posits this idea directly to the cosmos. Can we just assume that one space-time characterizes all of the universe? Or can we posit the idea that there are different regions of different space-times characterized by certain processes? themselves. And he says the processes would be not space, time, matter, energy as different things, but all subsumed under one process. So now, I think that is a brilliant hypothesis to posit, and it gives a very interesting perspective to look at some very controversial and um, interesting anomalies in astronomy today, uh, dealing with galaxies, very large-scale structures and uh, the issue of redshift, the measurement of redshift of galaxies and the measurement of the distances, what we think, what modern cosmology thinks are the distances 
of different galaxies. So to try and just do this briefly and not get too much in a lot of the details of the nature of the, the methods involved in these things, um, there's a characteristic called a Doppler shift to waves, wave phenomena. Um, sound waves, for example. People are familiar with the idea of if you hear a siren coming towards you on an ambulance, you, you can actually hear the pitch change when it's moving towards you versus when it's moving away from you. When, you see, when, you, when it's coming towards you, it sounds like a higher frequency. It's a higher pitch because it's being emitted from a body that's moving towards you, and the sound waves being emitted are then being somewhat squished and getting shorter wavelengths corresponding to a higher frequency. When it's moving away from you, you get the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. So the relative motion between an observer and a body emitting a, fre a frequency can affect what, how that frequency is perceived. The police use this all the time when they get you with their radar guns, not with sound waves, with light waves. They can actually measure the, they send an electromagnetic signal to your car. It hits your car, re-emits off your car, and because there's a relative speed between your vehicle and the cop with the radar gun, they can observe the, the shift in frequency and then determine what the relative speed is, determine how fast you're going and decide if you need that ticket or not. So it's, this is a general phenomenon we're familiar with, Doppler shifting, red shifting, blue shifting, shifting the color of light depending on relative motion. So now the point is, if you look at astronomy, you know, you can't, you look at other galaxies. I mean, our own, our own solar system is huge. Our galaxy is 300 billion stars, we think, our own galaxy. It's huge processes we're thinking about. Now we're looking at other galaxies completely outside of our our own galactic system. You know, these are immense things we're talking about and dealing with. We have no way of getting um, parallax measurement of these things. We have no way of sending a spacecraft out there. So we want to wait about, you know, a couple hundred million years or something like that. To, at least. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, we're kind of limited in what kind of observations we can get. We can look at the color of the light coming from these bodies. And it's been noticed that the, the um, spectrum of the light is often shifted to the red, indicating a relative motion uh, away, uh, away from us. Us as the observer, these galaxies appear to be moving away. And they appear to be moving away at different speeds, corresponding to different redshifts. And that you say they're shifted to the red. That's based on we have an idea of what would be making these different kinds of light. So we have an idea of what it should look like. Yeah, exactly. And you can see every um, different elements will have kind of fingerprints in the light they emit. So you can take, uh, you can examine the light, and you can kind of tell: is this light emitted from hydrogen being heated, or is this light being emitted from helium? being warmed up and causing it to emit light. And then you can see the same fingerprint, but shifted over to the red, indicating an expansion between us and those systems. Now, under the standard idea of cosmology, this, the amount of redshift directly corresponds to the distance, how far away these bodies are because it's operating under the idea that all of the universe is expanding. So the farther distance between our galaxy and another galaxy, the greater the amount of expansion occurring, the greater the relative speed. That's the standard idea of uh, cosmology accepted today. So that is moving fast. The further away it is, it's moving faster. Yeah. And so it's accelerating at the edges. Yeah. And the idea posited is that literally all of space is expanding. So if there's more space between us and a certain galaxy, there's more space to expand. And so there's a greater rate of expansion, a greater relative speed, so to speak, measured, greater redshift measured. So this is what's posited as the standard idea of how do we interpret these redshift measurements what's happening with these different galactic systems. So that's 
I know, kind of a lot of just setup, but then we see very immediate and serious and very controversial observations that tend to contradict this idea entirely. And a lot of this was um, pioneered by an astronomer who actually recently passed away, unfortunately, named Halton Arp, who was a very well-known, he actually worked with Hubble early on. He was actually featured as one of the top, like, 10 up-and-coming astronomers in the whole world when he was graduating from Caltech, I believe. He graduated from Caltech or went to work at Caltech, one or the other. Um, but he was not just some dude with a telescope in his backyard. He was, like, trained, working with the best people, understood as, like, one of the top up-and-coming people in astronomy. So he was skilled. You know, he wasn't just coming out of this not knowing anything. He started to see a lot of evidence, and there's no way we can go through all of it here, that you appear to have objects with very, very different redshifts, indicating there should be a very large separation between them in space. Actually, they appear to be either near each other or associated with each other or potentially interacting with each other. And here we have one, I think, I'm going to go through just two examples and then get back to Vernotsky and the question and implications of all this. Um, here you have uh, a set of galaxies called uh, Stevens Quintet, and I believe, or Stevens Quartet. There's five, yeah. Oh yeah, it's got a reflection from the light coming from here. Um, you can measure the redshift of each of these galaxies. Um, and if you plot the distances given by the redshifts, you get something to this scale about. So here's our Milky Way all the way on the far left. Here's one of the galaxies, the blue one in the top left there. By its redshift, it should be relatively about that distance from the Milky Way. And then further to the right, here are the rest of the galaxies in that system just plotted directly by redshift. This would just be the, this is the standard academic interpretation of what, what these systems are. We also see that there's a, another interesting object which appears to be as if in the middle of this upper right galaxy called a quasar, which is a Quasar, I mean, the word comes from quasi-stellar. Because when you look at these objects, they look, look like stars. They just look like a point source of light. You don't see spiral arms. You don't see a nebulous structure. You just see one point source of light. But they have extremely high redshifts. So we think they're outside of our galaxy. And um, basically, the current idea is that it look like they're cores, centers of very active galaxies. And the assumption is by the redshift measure, all of this upper scale gets reduced to just a tiny little gap there on the lower scale. And the quasar distance would be all the way completely over there. So the point being, these objects, this, these four galaxies we're measuring here in this quasar, all have extremely different, uh, should be extremely different distances, not interacting at all, very far apart. If we take another image looking in the, um, uh, I believe this one is in the uh, uh, X-ray imposed over an optical image, we see this structure in the blue kind of bridging between the different galaxies as if interacting between them. Um, you also see it clearly in the, um, in the infrared. You see this structure kind of stretching out, touching these different galaxies, which are supposed to be separated by a huge amount of uh, space and time. But you see signs, in this case, of interaction. Um, if you look purely in x-ray, a hard x-ray image, you can see a similar thing. And again, we have this quasar, which should be incredibly farther away. But it appears to be lining up and... Uh, directly, potentially in front of this galaxy, it should be much, much, much closer. 
So now you can just take this one example and you can say, okay, well, this is just a totally, you know, uh, happenstance situation where these things just happen to line up. This, this gas, gas cloud in between the galaxies just happen to have structures jetting out that kind of looks like it lines up with the different ones. And if this were all the evidence, then you could say this might just be a you know, freak coincidence. These things look like they're interacting. They look like they line up. But you, know, you have to take my word on this until you actually go through some of the work. There's dozens and dozens and dozens of different examples, different methods, different ways of looking at this that all indicate that redshift is not corresponding to distance, that there's something else going on, given these bodies this redshift characteristic. And here's just one other example. Two galaxies, significantly different redshift, should be very far away. This image is somewhat difficult to see, but there's this jet, this tail, coming out of the larger one down, stretching over, and reaching to the smaller one, indicating they're interacting, even though they should be dramatically different distances. Here's kind of an enhanced image pulling out the contrast of the different brightnesses so you can see that arm structure more clearly. And not only do you see the only place where there's a jet of material coming out of this upper galaxy is a place that connects directly to the other galaxy, which should have dramatically different redshifts, different distances. But we also see two additional objects in that arm connecting them. And those two additional objects are two quasars, which have much, much, much higher redshift. So again, just another case out of dozens, there's you know, entire books going through case after case after case of this, indications that you have dramatically different redshifted objects interacting. So what's going on here? So to return, you know, so the standard idea is that these all must just be flukes because Redshift is the expansion of space, and that's distance. So these are just you know, a bunch of anomalies, and none of this is, is real. Vernatsky obviously gives us a very different perspective for how to, um, how to approach this. Going back to the earlier quote, he says, um, poses the possibility that the... Uh, he says, another conception is logically possible. The conception of the geometrical in homogeneity of reality. The idea that we can have different geometries, different space-times simultaneously in the universe interacting at the same time. And we don't have to limit ourselves just to um, space and time, but matter, energy. We need to look at these things as part of a unified process, subsumed by some characteristic of development of a system and uh, begin the investigation from that standpoint. And there's a lot more that can be said on uh, further anomalies from the redshift perspective, um, for further anomalies on how do you understand galaxies as systems overall. Uh, and we can get into this in further reports and discussions and working some of this through, but just to kind of open up one, a couple initial questions from the standpoint of what Mr. LaRouche has put on the table of defining an entire new perspective for science rooted in the work of Kepler, Cusa, and Brunelleschi, and then seeing uh, that from the standpoint of the kind of pioneering work of Vernadsky is defining the front end of where science has gone and where science can go. You know, Jason discussed very clearly with this earlier triad, you had the complete shattering of the ideas of geometry, of uh, 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 Euclidean and Aristotelian type notions of causality in the universe, and you had the beginning of the introduction of physical cause as a conception. Mm -hmm. with Einstein and um, Planck, yet another revolution breaking down certain what I would call sense perceptual notions of causality in the universe and opening up a whole new domain of investigation. And with Vernadsky, uh, as Mr. LaRouche is emphasizing, you have the beginning of 
kind of a new approach to systems, to developing systems, or what I would probably call anti-entropic developing systems. And we have kind of the beginning teasing uh, questions and anomalies in galactic systems in the very large that can pose pay, uh, that their, rev their resolution can define the type of new paradigm that Kepler defined in his time, where in correspondence with the Renaissance, the rebirth of humanist thought, the development of sovereign nations, the progress of humanity overall, you had this scientific revolution in mankind's understanding of the universe and his relationship to the universe. And Mr. LaRouche has put a similar challenge on the table for us today in this time. With the type of global shift occurring right now, we need pioneers to drive the front ends of science, to define what are the questions and what's the direction and what's going to be the resolution to a new level of understanding of the nature of the universe, the nature of causality in the universe, and the nature, most importantly and fundamentally, of mankind's relationship to the universe. So there's a lot of details inherent in some of these questions just to kind of pose them, mm. the redshift and all this. But this is completely in line with the direction Vernotsky was going in, in posing a whole new idea of space, time, energy, matter being subsumed by a process. Galactic systems seem to indicate that's the direction you need to go to investigate them. You know, going back to what Jason had brought up, you know, as Mr. LaRouche has talked about these two triads, he's also mentioned the figures of Leibniz and Riemann as two figures that bridge those two triads. And I was just reminded of whenever you, what you were going through on the Kepler was very much like what Mr. LaRouche often cites as this last sentence in Riemann's habilitation dissertation, where he goes through this very elaborate and developed discussion of space. What is the nature of space? What is the nature of an n-dimensional manifold? But then he concludes by saying, this is all well and good, what I've gone through, but in reality, in physical reality, we've got to leave the domain of mathematics, the domain of imposed geometry, and go to the domain of physics. You have to actually go into and pose the question, what are the physical causes at work here? What are the principles, the physical principles at work here? And that's very much what Kepler did. I mean, he, despite what this scoundrel said about Kepler and how he came to his discovery, it wasn't just pulling a new geometrical figure out of the sky and imposing it on the solar system, mm -hmm. he went to the domain of physics. So what are the, what's the principle? What is a physical cause that's at work here? And what does that physical cause produce as, as a new, as a, you know, as a model? What does the physics produce? And, you know, similarly, this seems to be what's being posed in terms of how we need to understand what's happening at a galactic scale. Because, you know, much of, as you went through, much of what's drawn as conclusions about what must be happening when we see these redshifts is based off of imposing a certain model of the atom, for one, you know, mm -hmm. the, more, the Bohr model of the atom, you know, and this, which came out of this whole Copenhagen interpretation, which says you can't know physical causes. Right. All you have are statistical relationships. All you have are map models which give you some sort of statistical relation among things which you observe, and that's all you have. Whereas it seems necessary now to go back to this kind of method of Kepler, of Riemann, of saying what are the physics, what are the principles involved? And as I think really what Vernadsky opens up is the principle of life and then the higher principle of cognition. How might, if we now bring into this investigation, the principles that we understand of what is life and the principles we understand of the higher idea of cognition, noetic function, when those principles are introduced, how now does that change how we understand what our observations are? You know, as a living function, as a noetic function, what we're observing may not be nearly as anomalous as it seems when simply viewed from an idea of a very limited physical model, you know, if a a limited abiotic physics model. 
But when we bring in the principle of life, as Vernotsky has done, and mm -hmm. the higher principle of noetic functions, of cognition, we're going to have a very different way of approaching these kinds of anomalies. We're going to have a very different way of understanding and trying to investigate, in fact, what is occurring in these higher nested systems. Right. So I think that's, yeah, very much the direction we need to go with these things to see how Vernadsky has opened up a whole new path of investigation, a whole new method, and a whole new set of principles of investigation as we try to understand these greater nested systems, which, you know, we are actually active participants in. Let me to just read a short quote from Lynn. That's how he opened up his discussion with us last week when he was putting this challenge on the table. So he opened up by saying you have to, as Jason did, look at Vernadsky in parallel with the, with the previous triad. Look at Vernadsky in parallel with what Kepler and these guys did. And he said, Kepler discovered the solar system. But the solar system was not the concept of systems, per se. He said, Kepler solved a problem, but he does not solve the problem. He said, the idea of the solar system was not a concept of systems in general. And what you get with Vernadsky is the beginning to approach the idea of dealing with the concept of systems. Um, and then he went on to say, he said, we don't get systems, we don't even get systems as such with Vernadsky. Well, we get the implications of the systems. In other words, you can project from Vernadsky's work, you can project the idea of a general principle of systems, and that is what I want to concentrate on. In other words, it seems on the first pass you say, oh, how nice, Vernadsky has produced something which fits everything that is required for a new system. But then you say, wait a minute, this is not just a new system, this is a model for systems, this is a model uh, this is a standard for trying to uh, find new evidence which will tell you what the key is for the higher order sets of systems. So I think this is very much in line with the challenge that Mr. LaRouche is putting on the table to us but then to society generally of a new, an entire new higher order revolution in how we're thinking about approaching these things. And it's not just taking an extrapolation of what Vernadsky did per se, but trying to distill out the essence of his method and where it takes us and then to investigate these new phenomenon, these new challenges afresh from his standpoint. Yeah. Well, all right. Unless there's any poignant point to be made by either of you. I think there will be next week. Okay. <laughs> well, with that, I'd like to thank people for joining us and as it is with the universe, we are happily left with more questions than answers. So we'll see you all again next week.